מלך חללם אשר כשנו במצוותיו וציוונו לעסוק בדברי תורה. Please, Jehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, <coughs> know your name, <coughs> the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Jehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Hallelujah. Remain standing as we read from Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 7, and then also Isaiah 50, 10 and 11, and Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Hallelujah. All the mitzvot I am giving you today, you are to take care to obey, so that you will live, increase your numbers, enter and take possession of the land Yehovah swore about to your ancestors. You are to remember everything of the way in which Yehovah led you these 40 years in the desert, humbling, testing you, in order to know what was in your heart and whether you would obey his mitzvot or not. He humbled you, allowing you to become hungry, and then fed you with man, <coughs> which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known. To make you understand that a person does not live on bread alone, but on everything that comes from the mouth of Yehovah. And during these 40 years, the clothing you were wearing didn't grow old, and your feet didn't swell up. Think deeply about it. Yehovah was disciplining you, just as a man disciplines his child. So obey the mitzvot of Yehovah your God, living as he directs and fearing him. For Yehovah your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams, springs, and water welling up from the depths in valleys and on hillsides. Kalcha mitzvah asher no ki em tzuach hayom tishimrum la asot el ma'an tich tichyun ur betem u betam mirishtem et haaretz asher nishpa yachova el botekem ezrakaat et kalcha derek asher chaliyak yachova zech arabim shena hamidbar el ma'an anorek et soat el daet et asher et debaak tishmor tzimto inalo vayiknaak yamar Igbek imivak et hama asher lo yada et velo yadun ubet kem elman hadia kilo et hadechem halo ki chen adayam ki el kalmotsa pifi yahova yich ma adam shmelach aklob tatem vailayak imra kilo kizo zechor baim shina viyida imra bek ki asher asher ish et yuna yahova ma israek emishraet et mitzva Yahova el kel ikraku viro oto Yahova in belak le eretz toba eretz nachele maim ayat ut hayom yotzim bibirk u huvoha. Isaiah 50 10 11. Who among you fears Yahova? Who obeys what his servant says? Even when he walks in the dark without any light, he will trust in Yahova's reputation and rely on his God. But all of you who are lighting fires and arming yourselves with firebrands, go. Walk in the flame of your own fire, among the firebrands you lit. From my hands this awaits you. You will lie down in torment. Me become yere Yehova, shomei bekol abdol asher. Halayak chashekim vein noka, lo hibtach b'shem Yehova mishia elo yachu. Hin kalkem kod chei, esh mazrei lukot luku. Bo'ura ushkem ubzkot biyartem mayadi. Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Then the Ruach led Yeshua up into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary. And after Yeshua had fasted 40 days and nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of Yehovah, order these stones to become bread. But he answered, The Tanakh says, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of Yehovah. As Nasach HaRuach at Yeshua Yamid Bara, Elman Yenesech Asatan, Vaihi Achare Tsumo Arbaim Um Arabaim Elaya Virab, Vichadash Alayu Hamase, Boyomer Ibne Elohim Atadaber, Elbani Halech Ivite Yena El Chachem, Vayana Vayomer Him Katub, Eloar Halechem El Bado, Yecha Adam Ki Al Kamotza Fi Yehovah. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, that everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O <coughs> Yehovah, the giver of the truth. Amen. You can be seated. Tell someone I've come to hear. 
<clears throat> when we look at the Torah portion, a cave, a cave as a result, or it can be because, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about man shall not live by bread alone. We're looking at uh, Torah portions from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 12, clear through 11, 25. I'm going to focus on Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1 through 7. <clears throat> if we look at the, um, the communication between the enemy and Yeshua when he was tempted in Matthew 4, 1 through 4, what we find is the first temptation. Yeshua is driven into the wilderness by the Ruach, and he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And by the way, who told him to fast 40 days and 40 nights? <clears throat> the Father, if we remember on Wednesday night. He doesn't do anything but... Unless the father tells him. So he's 40 days and 40 nights into this, this fast. And if anyone's ever fasted, 40 days and 40 nights is a long time. And of course, what it says is at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights, he becomes hungry. And when he becomes hungry, the first temptation comes. And the enemy comes in and says, hey, you're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. And Yeshua responds with the word. The Torah says, the Tanakh says, the father says, Jehovah says. <clears throat> Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds or comes from the mouth of Yehovah. The first temptation is very important because if he would have failed that temptation, then he would have missed <clears throat> the very will and purpose of his father. He would have at that moment forfeited because his whole ministry and everything that his life was based on is going to be based on the word and what came out of the father's mouth. Nothing else but what came out of the father's mouth. We then jump to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, and we see that actually what Moses is doing is he's preparing the nation to enter into the land that was promised to them by Jehovah, and he reminds them <clears throat> that they need to take care to obey. Take care to obey. Or another translation would be guard in order to do all the commandments. When we look at Deuteronomy 8.1, it says take care to obey. It's the English understanding, and the English understanding can also say be careful to do or be careful to follow or dil diligently observe. The King James says to observe to do, and the New King James says be careful to observe. But in the stone humash, <clears throat> it says you shall observe to perform. So that English word observe and modern usage does not fully convey the importance of what the Hebrew understanding is talking about. And the Hebrew shamar, to guard, to take care of, to protect. What is the purpose of guarding the word of God in your life? And what is the purpose to protect the word of God in your life? So that you do it. Not that you just know it, but that you do it. <clears throat> so sometimes, you know, when we look at that word, we, we have to understand that the Hebrew term emphasizes the need to be active. Progressive, active. <clears throat> and <clears throat> guarding or protecting the commandments in order that they may be performed in your life. You're not sitting here just to know the commandments. You're sitting here to know them that you might do them. That there might be a follow through with what you know. Does you know good to have all the knowledge and wisdom of the, uh, of the world and not do anything with it? You get a Ph.D. in a certain subject, and then you, and then you work at Hardee's. It, it, it's no good, right? The whole purpose of gaining the wisdom and knowledge in a particular <coughs> uh, uh, a venue, in uh, particular uh, 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 classes, is so that you can perform and do those jobs. And so the, the main reason why we are to guard this word, to look over this word, is so that we will perform them. So we learn something from that, and what we learn is that intention is not enough. My intention is to do this. My intention is to draw closer. My intention is to follow the word. My intention is to be a good disciple. My intention is to be what he wants me to be. But intention is not enough because it has to be followed through. We may have good intention on obeying Jehovah's commandments, but unless we are careful to guard them, then we may render ourselves unable to perform the commandments of Jehovah. So that's why he tells us, be sober, be alert, guard yourself. So guarding the commandments then is equally important <clears throat> with doing them because one precedes the other one. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, it says all the commandments or all the mitzvah. Now, that is translated from an English understanding. So if we read that in English, it would be all the commandments I am giving you today. But actually in the Hebrew, 
<coughs> it is singular, mitzvah, or mitzvah. Literally means each commandment. Not all the commandments, but each commandment I am giving you. Now, you might say, well, what does that mean? What it means is that he's telling Israel and emphasizing to Israel, but you are not to pick and choose among the commandments because each commandment you are to obey. Each one has a particular place in our lives, each one. And so the commandments are a single entity woven together in a single cloth. So we have to begin to look at this word of God, not as an Old Testament, a New Testament, <clears throat> the first five books or the prophets or the writings or the gospels or the epistles. How do we need to look at this Bible? One. One. It is not the Old Testament for the old days. It's not the prophets and they're gone and done away with. It's not the writings and they're nice to read. It's not the Gospels where we learn about Yeshua. It's not the epistles where we have some understandings of the uh, apostles. What it is, it is all the word of Yehovah. It is the commandments of Yehovah. It is in one entity. It is one. As a husband and a wife become from two becoming one. Now, we are not separate, even though we are, we're now one. The unity of the whole Torah is why we often find the word commandment, the singular, when it's actually referring to the whole body of the commandments given to us in the Torah. <clears throat> if I give you an example of Matthew 15, verse 3, he answered, indeed, why do you break the commandment of Yehovah by your tradition? That's singular. The commandment. Didn't Yeshua say that if you break one commandment, you have broken, you have broken them all? Why? Because you can't separate them, because they're in unity, right? So it doesn't mean if you break one, you break them all, then you just break them all because you are going to break one. <clears throat> what he's trying to get you to understand is, is that one of them is just as important as all of them. And so if you're going to work to follow them, then follow all of them. Guard yourself so that you might protect yourself because this word is not a moment of picking and choosing. I'm going to do this commandment and I'm not going to do this one. This one's for today and that one was for yesterday. No, they are all from the mouth of God. <clears throat> no man lives by bread alone, but everything that proceeds out of the mouth of Jehovah. So this is one. Unity. It is a commandment. Made up of commandments, but it's a commandment. Romans chapter 7, verse 12 says, So the Torah is holy, that is, the commandment is holy, just, and good. What commandment? This Torah. This Torah from <clears throat> the first five to the prophets to the writings to the gospels to the epistles. So the use of the singular commandment often stands for the whole Torah because the Torah was always to be understood as a unified word, a unified Torah. It's important because what have we done in typical uh, contemporary Christianity? We've divided it. And when you divide it, then you start giving it a place. And when you give it a place, you give it a time and you give it a people. And actually, it's for all. Because he wrote it after he went from the end back to the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was. <clears throat> it's only later on that Christian theologians dis dissected the Torah into those categories, the moral, the civil, the ceremonial. But when you look at the life of Moses, he never separated them. When you look at the life of the prophets, they never separated them. When you look at the life of Yeshua, he never separated them. When you look at the life of the apostles, they never separated them. And actually, the separation for them, they would have considered it a division. Why are you dividing this word? We need to be listening to the whole counsel of Yehovah. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it's telling us that we have to be careful. <clears throat> we have to guard this Torah for the simple reason. You're going into the land. You're going in for your purpose. You're going into the promised land. And in order to maintain, in order to be there, in order to go in full force, you have to make sure that you are careful, that you guard these commandments in order to do them, in order to have life. So here's the question. How do we guard each commandment? in order to perform them. Number one. Number one way that we guard them, and I want you to write these down, is that we give ourselves to knowing what Yehovah has commanded, which means we study Yehovah's word to know what he has revealed. It's a very simple concept. <clears throat> it's very simple, but it's very hard. Because here's the thing. 
Most of us come here on a Wednesday or we come here on the Sabbath. And what do we want? We want the word of the Lord. You want me to study. You want me to come up with what I feel the Lord wants you to know <clears throat> and then deliver it to you. And then what do you want to do with that word? You want to eat on it all week long. Correct? And though it is my job to, to find and, and hear the voice of God, to find the face of him, to, to try to figure out what he wants corporately for you to know, you alone must study to show yourself approved. Eating once a week is not going to help you. Most of you couldn't handle once a week meal. Right? So 2 Timothy 2.15 says, do all that you can do. Study to show yourself approved to God as someone worthy of his approval, as a worker with no need to be ashamed because he deals straight forth <coughs> with the word of the truth. In order to guard yourself, you also have to study. We have, we have a, a, a great blessing in today's world because we have the ability to study beyond anyone else has had to study. <coughs> At our fingertips is everything that we ever possibly ever needed. See, I can understand why a lot of times in the olden days, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, that there was confusion about some things, but not anymore because now we have such information that we should be able to, <coughs> or be able to look at that word of God, tear that word apart, Apply it to our lives. I'm not talking about commentaries. I'm talking about looking at that word and really studying this word so that you understand it, that you have a, <coughs> a, 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 a great understanding of what it means to be in your life and what it means to live in your life. Study. You have to give yourself over to knowing. We give ourselves over to um, TV shows, to movies. We give ourselves over to our jobs. Correct. We give ourselves over to many things that we find to be important in our lives and yet fail to realize that the most important thing that's going to bring us into a place of life and joy and peace and a promised land. Is this commandment. It is obvious that we cannot do the commandments if we don't know them. <clears throat> and again, what do we do? We pick and choose the ones we want to know and then we pick and choose the ones we want to do. Number two, what do we have to do? You have to discipline your lives in order to be ready to obey the commandments. How many have some discipline in your life? How many get up every morning? That's a discipline. How many brush your teeth? Hold on, I want to see who's brushing your teeth. That's a discipline. Things that you do, <coughs> that you get up and do all the time, they're called disciplines. And we have to get to the point where we discipline our lives in order to be ready to obey the commandments. Sometimes we read the word of God and we're not ready to obey the word of God because we have not disciplined our life. What it means is, is that we order our lives in such a way that we have both the time and the means to obey Yehovah. I was saying to Lana Judah too last night, <clears throat> it's not a shock that today is the Sabbath because it's already been set in motion. And you know that every Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown is what? What is it? <coughs> Some of you are trying to figure out what is it? What is it? It's Sabbath. It's Shabbat. Does it creep up on you? Is it a surprise to you? Is it something that is, uh, you know, hidden from you every week? Or do you know that when Friday rolls around, Sabbath is coming and then Sabbath is here and then we come and we worship corporately. There's a holy convocation as we gather together to hear the word of God, to worship him, to praise him. And then we have that rest of that Sabbath to to honor him and to worship him. Correct. No secret. It's there every week. The same way you order your life that you know when you get up on Monday, you're going to go to work. On Tuesday, you're going to go to work. On Wednesday, you're going to go to work. And you order your life accordingly, correct? You should have already ordered your life knowing that as I order my life, I look at the festivals, I look at the Sabbaths, I look at other things in my life. I am ordering my life <clears throat> that none of those things are a shock to me and I am able to perform them. And I make ample plans. And I prepare for every Moedim. So when someone says to you, hey, I got something to do on Saturday, you say, I'm sorry, I've already ordered my life. My life has already been ordered. This is where I'm going to be. There, there's not any changing of it. I have to go here because my life is ordered. 
I don't throw my life as a, you know <clears throat> to the wind, caution to the wind. I have an ordered life. I'm making sure that I'm getting up. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And anyone that's ever done anything <clears throat> that's going to be important and maintain it and continue to maintain it and be successful, you have to order your life. You have to be disciplined in it. But a lot of times when it comes to the commandments, we're not as disciplined and ordered as we are in our natural lives. And we need to take that word seriously, that every commandment, we need to make sure that we've ordered our life and disciplined our lives so that they fall into our life. We don't change the word of God to fit in our lives. We change our lives so that the word of God reigns supreme and priority in our lives. The third we need to incorporate into our daily lives those things that foster our growth in faith. You make sure what's good for you and you eat it. You make sure you have to have a certain amount of water and you what? You drink it. You make sure you need to have a certain amount of exercise and you still de debating how much exercise is necessary. You need to incorporate into your daily lives those things that foster our growth in faith. Faith. Anyone that has a child, you say, listen, <clears throat> you need to eat that because you're you're growing. You need that to grow. Right. You need your sleep so you can grow. You need to have exercise so you can grow. The muscles become strong and and, and you can be mentally alert and physically alert. And so <clears throat> you train up a child in the way he should go that when he's old, he will not depart. So spiritual growth. So you have to incorporate into your daily lives things like, you know, <clears throat> reading the word. Consistently having some prayer time. Consistently reading and studying that word, meditating upon the word of God. Consistently incorporate it into your life. Same way you incorporate everything else in your life, incorporate that into your life. I find that we incorporate in our lives those things that are important to us. Correct? I don't have time for my children. It's because they're not important to you. You will make time for what is important to you. Right. And if regular prayer time is important to you, you will incorporate it into your life. If consistent Bible study and meditation upon the word is important to you, you will <clears throat> make it a discipline of faith in your life. Regularly coming together, forsake not the assembling of yourself. Regularly coming together with one's community for corporate worship, fellowship and study. That's a commandment. Number four. Remember, Sabbath day and keep it holy. And have a holy convocation, right? Incorporate those things. Obeying Yehovah requires faith. And the more that we set ourselves to walk in his ways, then the more it will require our full reliance upon him. The more you have prayer, the more you have study, the more you have <coughs> corporate worship, the more you have uh, in your life those things that will cause you to become um, a greater disciple, a greater follower that will cause greater faith to rise. Well, that's what we need. A further aspect of guarding in order to do involves remembering. How many can remember some of the things that Yehovah has done in your life last year? A year ago? Ten years ago? Has he done some spectacular things for you 20 years ago? How about 40 years ago? I remember 57 years ago, he did something very spectacular for my mother. He gave her me. <laughs> Take a moment and remember. Remember the things that he's done for you, because what happens in our lives is that we go so focused on what is happening today that we forget what he can do and that what he has done. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, what does he say? <clears throat> he says, you are to remember everything of the way in which Jehovah led you these 40 years in the desert. First of all, you are to do all the commandments and you are to guard them so that you guard them so that you will do them. And when you guard them so that you will do them, there's some things that you will do to make sure they're done. And that also means that you will remember because the enemy wants you to forget what I've done. He wants you to forget what I do. He wants you to forget how I blessed you. He wants to get you to forget what I am to you. Remember the children of Israel? Oh, I wish we'd just be back in Egypt. Oh, I remember what we were eating there. They forget about what was happening to them. 
So we have to remember that 40-year experience in the barren wilderness proved that Yehovah supplies. You sitting here this morning proves he supplies. You sitting here <clears throat> smelling nice, looking nice, dressed nice, hair, some of you hair nice. No, I'm just kidding. You know he supplies, right? He supplies your needs. He has watched over you. And sometimes our faith is strengthened as we rehearse what he's done, as we remember what he continues to do in our lives. If you ever get down and out and you figure out, what, what am I going through? Think about what he's already done for you. Stop for a moment and think about it. Quit focusing on the bad. Quit focusing on what you're going through. And, and again, turn and say, let me remember. Let me remember what he did in 1992. Let me remember what he did in 1994. Let me remember what he did in 2000. Let me remember what he did in 2002. Let, let me remember what he did in 2010. Let me remember what he did <coughs> just last year. Let me remember what he did yesterday. And when you remember those things, it helps you to guard, to make sure you do. Remember last week? Keep and do. Keep and do. Keep and do. Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at verses 2 through 6. You are to remember everything in the way in which Jehovah led you these 40 years in the desert. And what's that say? What does that word say? Humbling. Actually, that's a very nice word, but actually the word is afflicting. How many like the word humbling better? The Lord is humbling me. Actually, it should say the word that the, the Lord is afflicting me. And testing you. In order to know what was in your heart. <clears throat> so you're in the wilderness. How many know that you're in a wilderness right now, correct? We're headed toward the promised land, but we, we don't have that promised land right now. We're all going through the valleys and experiences of our lives. It's called a wilderness, correct? He's with us. Hallelujah. But in the wilderness, what happens? You are afflicted and you are tested to see what your heart is all about. whether you would obey his commandments or not. So why are you tested? Why are you afflicted? To see if you've guarded those commandments and that you would observe them. So those things that are coming in your life that challenge the word of God are the test or the affliction to see whether you can stand up and say, no, <clears throat> I've already ordered my life. I already study the word and know which is true. And I've ordered my life and I've incorporated this into my life. So therefore, I'm remembering what Yehovah has done for me. And I'm putting these things in operation. So therefore, the affliction or the test reveals that I will follow him. No matter what. Look at those words. Afflict. Test. To know what is in your heart. If you read on, their garments never wore out. And their feet never swelled. Look at your feet. Giving praise. Because one day they weren't swollen. In other words, Jehovah provided for their physical well-being when they were in their greatest need. And you sitting here is a living testimony that no matter what you've gone through in those many years of your life, he's met it. You're still alive. You're still breathing. But Moses also reminds the people that Jehovah's provision for them during the days of their journey came as a test. Now, I know it's not really <clears throat> what is preached today because what is preached today is prosperity and power and blessing only. And that when you're going through something, you have to check yourself. And if you're going through something, just rebuke the devil. But in reality, when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, what is it saying? It's saying, who did the affliction? Who brought the testing? And who wants to know what your heart is all about? Yehovah. So here's Yehovah, who leads them in order to humble them, to afflict them, to test them. To know what their heart is all about, whether they would keep the commandments or not. <clears throat> Who brings you sometimes into the valley of the shadow of death? Come on. You can say it. It's okay. Who brings you into a trial or testing or a shadow or something in your life that is not comfortable? We don't want to say it. Because if we say it, then that means there's a purpose to it. And we'd rather believe that there's no purpose to it, so we need to get rid of it. Because if there's no purpose to it, we get rid of it. But if there's a purpose to it, we work through it. Right? And here we learned a very valuable lesson. And this is the lesson that we need to learn. 
<clears throat> is that the hardships that come upon the people of Elohim may be from the hand of Yehovah to prove the reality of our faith and our love for him. That affliction could be to see whether you would obey or not obey. That test could be to see if you would obey or not obey. <clears throat> now, in order to have this kind of perspective, when difficult times arises, that requires faith in the first place, doesn't it? Because we are people of comfort, and as people of comfort, when we're uncomfortable, what do we want? We fix it. We get rid of it. <clears throat> You're making me uncomfortable. I don't want to be around you anymore. I'm uncomfortable here. I don't want to be here anymore. We start a, a, a mission. We start a job. We start a schooling. It becomes too rough. We, we don't want to do it anymore. It is too hard, too uncomfortable. And we are living in such a society today that we can just quit and start something else. Right? So if you have a conflict with a sister here, well, I'll just quit and go to somewhere else. There's all other churches. Hallelujah. I'll go to other churches. But the thing is, you follow your own conflict. Because you were the one in the conflict. So here's the question for you in your life. Would your difficulties in the wilderness lead you to doubt Yehovah and put him to the test? The answer is in our speech. Why, God? What's going on? <coughs> our, our thinking processes and what we say to him reveals whether these difficulties in the wilderness, we are doubting him and not trusting him. I'm not saying that they're easy. But I'm saying he's still on the throne. Right? Faith begins with a fundamental confession that Yehovah is good. Everyone say that. Yehovah is good. Say it again. Yehovah is good. Say it again. Yehovah is good. Say it again. Yehovah is good. Don't you hate preachers tell you to repeat? Say it again. Yehovah is good. Say it again. Yehovah is good. Some of you are rebellion right now. I am not saying Yehovah is good. <coughs> Yehovah is good. If you won 700 million, Yehovah is good. If you lost 700 million, the devil is a liar. <laughs> no, Yehovah is good. When you're on a mountain experiencing such glorious victory, Yehovah is good. When you're in the valley of the shadow of death, Yehovah is good. When you have enough to eat on the table, Yehovah is good. When you barely have enough, Yehovah is good. When you're getting along with your spouse, Yehovah is good. When you're not getting along with your spouse, and it's not Yehovah is good, it's Yehovah is good. From the beginning, faith reasons that life's hardships are not the result of random, unplanned events in our lives. Nothing that happens to you is random. Nothing that happens to you is unplanned. Now, they're random to you, and they're certainly unplanned to you. But who orchestrates our lives? Yehovah does. And even if the enemy looks like he's attacking us and doing a very good job of attacking us, who still knows that he was going to <coughs> attack us? And who still is there with us to turn all those things that were meant for evil for good? So are they random? Are they unplanned? No. Nor are they punishments from a God who can never be pleased with us. I was talking to someone yesterday, Atlanta Judah. <clears throat> She's been going through a lot of stuff. She appreciated the word. She was going through a lot of stuff. And she just says, you know, I, I go through it and I <clears throat> just have these moments when I'm not thinking right. So I say things that are wrong. And, you know, she was, you know, crying. She said, I just know that, you know, when I say those things or do those things or think those things that here I am. That the father just kind of like leaves me because he can't be with me. He's so disappointed in me. And I stopped her and said, stop. You can't do anything that will make him leave you. Especially if your heart wants him. And I said, you have to stop looking at that you are disappointing him. And realize you might make him sad because of the choices you make. But you cannot disappoint him. In that, disappoint to the place where he will walk away from you. 
And what you have to do is stop looking at what you're doing as who you are and look at it as what you've done. When you attach what you have done to who you are, you might have lied, right? But it doesn't mean you are a liar. <coughs> now, if you are a liar, he cannot be with you, right? But if you lied, he will work with you. You, you see the difference? And so when we look at this, <coughs> these hardships that we go through are not a result of punishment from God for, for something you've done because you can never please him because then the end result is you are flesh, you are blood, he is God. And in the scope of your thinking, you will never please him. But yet he still what? Loves you. So don't look at them as punishments or random or unplanned. Rather, look at life's hardships, including divine discipline, that they are ordered by the Almighty for our good and His glory. Why am I going through this? For His good, for my good and His glory. Or we don't have to believe Romans 8.28. What does Romans 8.28 say? Furthermore, read it with me. We know that Yehovah causes. I'm waiting for everyone to read with me. Furthermore, we know that Yehovah causes everything. What? Everything. What? Everything to work together for the good of those who love Yehovah and are called in accordance with his purpose. How many here have a purpose? How many here <coughs> love him and are called? How many here know that God loves you? Then that means that everything will work together. You don't need that verse when everything's working together. You don't need that verse when everything's A-OK. -okay. When do you need that verse? When life's hardships are happening. When the random unplanned events that you believe are random and unplanned <coughs> are coming into your life, that's the verse you need. When you're going through the deepest trials, that's the verse you need. When you're going through the, the, the lowest moments of your life, that's the verse you need. That those things were work out for good. Not bad, but good. Yehovah has chosen those who are his, and by his own grace, he has brought them into a covenant and a family relationship with him. You sit here as part of the family. In an all-wise and sovereign providence, he brings those things into our lives that will temper the metal of our faith. Iron sharpening iron. And at the same time, offer opportunity to display our love for him. You really display your love for him when you're going through something that is contrary and you choose the word over your feelings. Tempering the metal of your faith. When the heat's applied to metal, what rises? Impurities. And then what has to be taken away in order for the metal to be pure? The impurities. <clears throat> so you go through the fire and the impurities rise. All of a sudden you reveal who you are. All of a sudden it reveals that conflict you had with the sister, that conflict you had with the brother, the conflict you had with your spouse, that conflict you had at work. It reveals who you are. It reveals something inside of you. The conflict, the trial, the testing that you're going through, it reveals something. How you feel, it reveals something. And what you need to do is allow that in so that, that impurities can come to the top, that you yourself can remove those impurities. We don't always understand why bad things happen to good people. How many find themselves to be good people and bad things happen to you? Hello? Make a list. So, Pastor, explain it to me. I can't. I can't explain. My ways are not his ways. My thoughts are not his thoughts. I would not even begin to try to figure out what is going on. Here's the only thing that I know. <coughs> he and his works are righteous. And the events of my life and your lives are ordered by his hand. So all I can tell you is, Yehovah is good. Pastor, this is what I'm going through. It's really horrible. What's your advice? 
Yehovah is good. Pastor, that doesn't help me. Yehovah is good. Keep and do, keep and do, keep and do. Yehovah is good. Yeah, but this one. Okay, so stop. Start remembering the things that he has done for you. Start remembering the things where you've had victory. Start remembering the things where he turned things around. Start remembering things where he came to your aid and all of a sudden that which was evil turned around for good. Remember those. And now that you're in the midst of this, he is good. Because he's a, still the same God, isn't he? And if he did it yesterday and he did it five years ago and he did it 20 years ago, can he not do it today? So we have to remember that in the midst of the difficult events in life, each event offers an opportunity to meet and to manifest our trust and love of him. Then we gain strength to meet the challenges that we face. Deuteronomy 8, starting with verse 1. I want you <clears throat> to know that each commandment, you are to make sure that you guard them so that you observe and then do them. And then I also want you to remember that I am able, that I'm going to bring you through a wilderness, and when I bring you through the wilderness, there's some things I'm going to do for you. I'm going to afflict you. I'm going to test you to know whether or not where your heart is and whether you will observe those commandments that, that you have guarded in your life. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, what does it say? But now this is what Jehovah says. He who created you, Yaakov, he who formed you, Israel, don't be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I am calling you by your name. You are mine. Amen. We like that verse right there. It, now let's just get rid of verse 2. All we need is verse 1. We all, all we need to know is that he's calling my name and that um, <clears throat> he loves us and he's redeemed us, right? But he's reminding you what he's done for you. And then he brings you into verse 2, which says what? When you pass through water. Did he say, when you pass through water, I will cause you to escape it. I will reach out my hand and get you out of it. No, what's he say? When you walk through water, I will be with you. So you're in the water. Help me, help me. And he's like, I'm with you. What's the next one? When you pass through rivers, the difference between a water and a river is that water mostly is still. A river is roaring. So now you're just not still looking at him saying, help me. Now you're like, help. And what's he say? Hang on. It won't overwhelm you. What do we want him to do? Stop the river, get us out, wipe us down, dry us off, hold us, and rock us. Right? And what's he do? I'm with you. I'm with you. So you go from still water to raging river. And then what's he say? And when you walk through fire. You will not be scorched. Well, that's good news for me. Thank you. I would prefer that there be no fire. I would prefer that the fire be quenched. I would prefer that you would <coughs> change a different direction. I would prefer that the Ruach wind would come and blow it out. But apparently not. I'm going to have to what? Walk through fire. You will not be scorched, and the flame will not burn you. Well, isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing? Don't we just love that? Or do we like the verse that says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and all those that rise against me shall fall? Don't we like greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world? Don't we like that even though they went into the fiery furnace? No, we don't like that. We'd rather not be in the fiery furnace. We'd rather not face the mouth of a lion, right? We'd rather the lion be dead before we got there. That's our miracle. Our miracle is that when we put in the lion's dead. Our miracle is when we put our one foot into the flame. It <laughs> but God's miracle is this. I'm in the midst of the fire. Come on in. He has preserved us through it. In water, what will, what will happen? He'll be with us. In raging river, what will happen? It won't overwhelm us. In fire, what? 
How does that happen? It happens because you guard yourself to observe and do the commandments. And you make those choices, good choices, and then God is on your side. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What's the next part? Why? Why won't you fear evil? Because it doesn't get you out of it. Right? Because his rod and staff, they'll comfort me. Comfort me? Get me out of here. Walk with me. Where is the escape? Where is the exit sign? Enough is enough. No, because the impurities are rising. And what do you have to do with those? You have to get rid of them. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5, what does it say? <clears throat> so now think deeply about it. Yehovah was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his child. Wow. Wow. See, what they thought was, here I come, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt, I'm taking you to the promised land. And all they saw was getting out of a conflict and going to a promised land where the land was flowing with milk and honey and the grapes were big and everything was wonderful, hallelujah, and God is God. But what they failed to realize is to come out of Egypt, <clears throat> there is a wilderness in between, right? Most of us say to ourselves, I can't wait for heaven, I can't wait for you. Oh, Yeshua, so come. The reason why you want him to come is because you're going through hell right now. And you want an escape route. But he doesn't want to come right now because he wants you to learn. He wants you to grow. He wants you to guard. He wants you to do. He wants you to come to a place that you are better, that the impurities have been lifted out of you, <clears throat> that you can now face the water or the river or the fire and not be moved by it. Think deeply about it. I'm bringing you out of Egypt by my hand, by the blood on the doorpost. Then I'm bringing you through the sea to baptize you. I'm bringing you to the mountain to give you this ketubah, this Torah. And then we're going to start this thing out. We're going to start allowing some things in your life. I'm going to afflict you. I'm going to test you. And I'm going to know what your heart is all about. And what you don't realize what it was, it was actually Discipline. Proverbs 3.12 says, For Jehovah corrects those he loves like a father who delights in his son. So when you're in a conflict, what do you say? Jehovah, you are good. And you must really, really, really love me. <laughs> I mean, really, really at this moment, <laughs> I really feel such love from you. Why does he chasten Israel? Why does he chasten you? Because he loves Israel, because he loves you. And he has chosen us, you, me, for himself. Any parent who thinks he or she is loving their child by withholding correction, you're self-deceived. That is not love. You must correct. Because you want those impurities out of their life. You want them to be a successful good, mature adult, and you have a very short time to do it in. There's nothing worse <coughs> than a, there's something worse than a two-year-old who has a temper tantrum. It's a 30-year-old who has a temper tantrum. That's even worse because you can't sit on them. You can't time them out. You can't even swat at them because they'll swat back at you. Hebrews chapter 12, 10 and 11. For they disciplined us only for a short time, who? Our natural fathers. And only as best they could, <coughs> right? We only do the best we can. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we do good. Sometimes we hit the money. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we did it right. Sometimes we did it wrong, right? Is that, is that your experience as a parent? Did you ever spank your child and know that you did it correctly and everything, and afterwards you loved them, whatever, and then sometimes you spanked your child because you were angry? See, no one wants to admit that. I have never been angry and hitting my child. <laughs> you may lie if you want. That's okay. But sometimes you react, and you shouldn't have reacted. 
correct? Even if it's a screen, you shouldn't have screened. So we do it good. We do the best we can. But he disciplines us in a way that provides, say those two words, genuine benefit to us and enables us to what? Share in his holiness. <clears throat> Testing, affliction, knowing your heart. You're guarding the commandments so that you might do them and observe them. And he takes you through the affliction. He takes you through the test to know your heart through the water, through the river, through the fire. Impurities rise. You remove them so that you can share in his holiness. He does it because everything in your life, and I know we don't see it and I know we don't get it. And I know you might not be able to say, amen, Yahweh is good. But it's to benefit us. The ability to receive that discipline of Jehovah in this manner is the fruit of genuine faith, a faith that considers Jehovah's word as the very substance of life itself. Israel learned this from the manna. The story of manna is what? <clears throat> they were hungry. Why were they hungry? What's the word say? Why were they hungry? It's not up there, but what, what's the word say? Does anyone know why they were hungry in the wilderness? I mean, the simple question, I mean, the simple answer would be they didn't eat. But here is the real answer. Because God withheld food. So who made them hungry? Jehovah did. And he made them hungry so he could feed them. Read the scripture in Deuteronomy 8. He withheld the food. Then gave them food when they were hungry. Well, the whole thing would be if we were having a conversation with God is. Why are you withholding food if you know I'm going to be hungry? Just give me food. Right. <clears throat> but in giving the food, he says to them here, I want you to gather enough for today. But don't try to gather and store it for tomorrow. So our daily bread, just enough for today. Right. And then he said on Friday, I want you to gather twice as much because. Manna will not be given on the Sabbath. So I have to make you hungry so that I can feed you. And when I feed you, I'm going to feed you in a way that you will remember who I am. Because the food is not what sustains you. It is I who will sustain you. In other words, the manna was given to sustain physical life, but it also was to teach the important lesson that life as Jehovah intends, it is sustained through obedience to him. Almost every commandment's the same. You have your money, but you're supposed to give him 10. Why? Because the 10% represents that he is the one who supplied the 90. Hello? And when you withhold it, <clears throat> you are saying you made it. And you sustain you. The reason why you have six days of work and seventh day to be a rest. Is for the simple reason that. He's given you six days to maintain. And if you take that seventh day and work it, then you're telling him he's not the one that sustains you. You will sustain yourself. Did everyone leave? I got quiet. I mean, it's like. Phew. Every commandment has a affliction and a test <clears throat> to know whether you will follow it or not. So he withholds the food from them because, you know, the same God that caused the clothes not to decay and the feet not to swell could have also caused their bellies to be filled. But he has to teach them something. What does he have to teach them? <clears throat> Man does not live by bread alone. Now, you have to have bread because you can't live it by it alone, but it means you have to have it. You have to have a job in order to sustain life, to have electricity, right? None of you sit here saying, well, I haven't, I haven't worked for 20 years, and I still have lights, and I still have air, and I still have heat, and woo, and I still have gas in my car. None of you sit here like that. If you do, come here. I, I want you to lay hands on me. You need to work in order to have that. But who is the one who gives you the money for the light? Who is the one that gives you money for the heat? Who is the one that gave you money for your car? 
<clears throat> he is. And you prove it by following that commandment. You prove it by making sure that you work six and you're off one. That when you, every time you eat bread, you lift it up and you thank him for it. That every time the Sabbath is coming, you're here. Every time a Moedim is there, you do it. Because it reminds you that life truly is not in what you do, but it's in what he has allowed you to do. And that is in obedience to that word. That is what sustains your life. So Deuteronomy 8.3. He humbled you or he afflicted you. And what's it say? Allowing you to become hungry and then fed you with manna. He allowed you to go through the affliction. <clears throat> which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known, to make you understand. What's he want you to understand? Why does he want you to work six and be off one? Why does he want you to only <clears throat> gather on six days? Why does he want you to give a portion of your money? Why does he want you to be uh, uh, committed and come and, and never forsake the assembly of yourself? Why? Going through the commandments. Why does he want you to honor your mother and father? Why, 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 why? It says it all in here. To make you understand that a person does not live on bread alone, but on everything that comes from the mouth of Yehovah. And when you break that, you are saying, I sustain me. I take care of me. I will give you an offering here. I'll give you an offering there. I'll come when I want. I'll do what I want. I'll work when I want because it's all about me. <clears throat> but when you follow his commandments and you guard to make sure that you observe them and you order your life that sometimes you have to say no and I will not and I cannot and I will not do that. What it actually is saying to him is I recognize who you are. The bottom line is this. Life is more than mere physical existence. Life, as Jehovah intends it, is to be made complete through conforming to his words, to all that he reveals to us as true. The message of the Messiah is the same. Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Verse 4 especially. What does he say? <clears throat> hey, you're hungry, and you should eat. You don't want to die, correct? So just take these stones and make them bread. And as hungry as he was, and who allowed him to be hungry? The Father. Who sent him into the wilderness? The Father. Who told him not to eat for 40 days and 40 nights? The Father. Hey, take these stones at your weakest moment. Take these stones at the time that you want to give up and eat. Take these stones. And Yeshua says, Yehoah is good. And he has said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yehoah. I cannot, <clears throat> if he called me to the wilderness and if he has caused me to hunger, then it will be him who feeds me, not me. And I recognize him as the one who feeds me. In this portion, it alerts us to one of the greatest deterrents. And we sit here in this day and age with the influence of this great deterrent that Moses saw in the future. He saw it for them and he sees it for us. And the greatest deterrent of our faith and the greatest deterrent to our obedience is affluence. The abundance of prosperity, the flow and supply, the plenty of supply, material goods, money, wealth. What drives us? Having more, wanting more, deserving more, desiring more. <clears throat> what do we experience in today's world? The more you have, the better off you are. Better stuff you have. We're striving for, we want prosperity, flow and supply. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, 7 through 14, for Jehovah your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and springs and water welling up from the depths and valleys on hillsides. It is a land of wheat and barley and grape, uh, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. 
<clears throat> a land where you can eat food in abundance and lack nothing in it, a land where the stones contain iron, the hills can be mined for copper. Wow, come on, who don't want to go there? So you will eat and be satisfied, and you will bless Jehovah your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful. Guard yourself. Not to forget Jehovah your God. And how do you forget him? See, some of you say, well, you don't understand. I got to do this thing. Other but I don't forget him. I still love him. No, he says you forget him by what? By not obeying his mitzvah. His rulings, his regulations that he's given them today. That's how you forget him. Oh, you might know him, you might praise him, but you forgot him because you don't follow through with what this word says. That's the proof of it. I didn't write that. He wrote that. Otherwise, after you have eaten and are satisfied, built fine homes and lived in them and increased your herds, your flocks, your silver, your gold and everything else you own. <coughs> you will become what? Proud hearted. Forgetting Jehovah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you lived as slaves. Moses said, we're going somewhere. This is what you got to do. Deuteronomy chapter 8, you got to do it. And what's going to happen is if you're not careful, you're going to go in there and you're going to not be thankful. And because you're not thankful, which means you're not doing the commandments, you're going to forget me. And what's going to happen is something horrific. Because look what happens, 14 through 20. You will become proud-hearted, forgetting your holy God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you lived as slaves, who led you through the vast and fearsome desert and its poisonous snakes, scorpions and waterless thirsty ground, who brought water out of flint rock for you, who fed you in the desert with manna, unknown to your ancestors, all the while afflicting and testing you in order to do good in the end. You will think to yourself, my own power and the strength of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. No. You are to remember Jehovah, your God, because it is he who's given you the power to get wealth in order to confirm his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as is happening even today. And if you forget Jehovah, your God, follow other gods, serve and worship them, I am warning you in advance today that you will certainly perish. And you will perish just like the nations that Jehovah is causing to perish ahead of you, because you will not have heeded the voice of Jehovah, your God. When I look at these commandments as one and I guard myself to follow them, I study them so that I might know them, right? I apply them to my life. I have discipline in my life so that I will have the regular disciplines of faith and I incorporate them into my life. <coughs> and then I'm obedient and being reminded of what he's done for me, which means I now give thanks for him. Because I work six and on the seventh I give thanks and I work and give him a tenth and I give thanks and I come. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come to the house of the Lord and I come and I give thanks because I want to do what he wants me to do. And I want to remember it is he who sustains me because bread alone will not. My job alone will not. My car will fail me. My house will fail me. My spouse will fail me. My children will fail me. Come on. <clears throat> this house will fail you from time to time. I will fail you. Hello? Each other, we will fail each other, correct? But who will never fail us? We must continually give thanks for all things, and then we will constantly be reminded who the real source is of the good things we possess. The commandments are set up for us to remember that. So remember this as I close. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Jehovah. Learn the lesson of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Learn the lesson of Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Study to show yourself approved. A workman not ashamed. Making sure you divide the word of truth in your life being shares of his holiness. But remember, whatever you're going through, an affliction, a test, a water, a river, a fire, Yehoah is good. And all the time, he is good. Let's stand before him.
Children, come on. Yehovah, I praise you and thank you for each child that's represented underneath this prayer shawl. Whether they are Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, Father, Lord, whether they are Leah, whether they are Esther, whether they are Father of Miriam, whether they are Ephraim or Manasseh or a Joseph or a Peter or a Paul, bring them to the saving knowledge of your son, Yeshua, the Messiah, that the word, the Torah, Rule and reign in their lives. Watch over them, protect them, guide them, lead them. And Father, let your Ruach, Father, empower them. Let them be the witness in this generation. <clears throat> Father, bless their ways. Watch over them and make them great vessels and disciples for you. And we thank you for their lives. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing. Yevarechecha Yahovah Yehovah, he who exists, kneel before you, presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. <coughs> May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts. 